Hey Siri, what does inebriated mean? So this is the time of year when I get inundated with questions from new photographers trying to figure out where to get started with that camera they found under the Christmas tree last year. So I'm going to spend the next couple of videos answering the most common questions I get from beginning photographers. Starting with today's topic, by far the most frequently asked question, what kind of camera should I buy? So this video will be helpful if you don't have a camera and you're trying to decide what kind you need for the type of photography you want to do. Or if you do have a camera and maybe you're in the situation that I found myself in when I started out, bashing my head against the wall trying to get this camera to do things it wasn't really made to do. Instead, let's start out by looking at some things your camera is good at so we can fast track you to getting out and enjoying some photographic success with it. So if you're new, my name's Matt and this is an outdoor photography channel. So uh, the advice I'm going to give will be skewed towards scenic and landscape photographers. If you love the outdoors, thank you so much for using the thumbs up button to like this advice. And uh, I do plan on getting out and trying a couple cameras in the field. And I actually think that this cheaper camera is going to do better. So if you're more interested in seeing that kind of video, you can skip ahead to this time and then I'll see you out in the woods to make some photos together. So the good news for landscape photographers is that we don't really need a lot of the upgrade features like faster autofocus, higher frame rates, uh, etc. that differentiate the uh, three or four cameras a manufacturer will offer in the same sensor. So uh, in other words, there's no difference between a landscape photo taken with the cheapest and the most expensive camera when they have the same sensor inside. Which is to say that landscape photography isn't a particularly uh, technologically demanding type of photography. So while we're not so interested in all the incremental nickel and dime upgrades, there are some landscapes for which it's the sensor that counts and unfortunately, it's also the sensor that costs. So there are a few standards for sensor sizes. This is a full frame camera. The sensor is the same size as a 35 millimeter film frame, so it's pretty close to an industry standard. And most photographers you've seen working professionally at uh, like weddings or news or sports events, they were probably working with this sensor size. It pairs up nicely to capture the full image from vintage and legacy lenses. This is an APS-C camera. Look how tiny. This is the most common uh, sensor size for entry-level interchangeable lens cameras. So it's illuminated by the center two-thirds of a conventional lens, or you can uh, purchase special, smaller, cheaper lenses that are made to uh, just illuminate this smaller sensor. Generally, smaller sensors receive less light and have smaller photosensitive transistors that are packed tighter together. So as a matter of physics, they necessarily will make images with more noise and less detail and, um, and lower color fidelity than a larger sensor that's interpreting the same light pattern. And generally, larger sensors are found in more rugged and higher quality camera bodies that mount up to higher quality optics. Or even shorter, small sensor, lower still image quality, bigger sensor, higher image quality. The other big difference is field of view, and this is one that's probably going to have you upgrading to a full frame camera at some point because you're going to want to shoot some big, expansive, wide angle landscape. You're going to run into a lot of trouble with this sensor that can't capture the whole image from the lens. There are some special purpose wide angle lenses that do a pretty good job of squeezing a landscape down into a crop sensor size. Right, I've owned a few of them and they're, they're a good time and they're fun to learn with, but but ultimately their quality reflects that they're designed for use on a cheap camera. However, not every landscape is suited to a wide angle razzle dazzle treatment. And one type of scene where I find I'm always looking for more reach, more sharpness and more depth is the deep woods photograph. And I'm increasingly finding that the crop sensor camera is just better suited to delivering on those three requirements. More reach because it's cropping into the image, more sharpness because it's completely cropping out the dim, muddy, distorted edges uh, of the image and uh, more depth because I, I don't want to make a whole video about depth of field. But uh, since I'm aiming this advice at beginners, there are, there are two things that extend a photo's area of sharp focus, which is called its depth of field. And one is the distance from the, 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 the more distance, the broader distance of the field. And the other side is the opening. Side. Okay, okay. The smaller sensor camera offers a broader depth of field. So there are a lot of times when I might grab this uh, little camera because it's smaller, it's lighter, it's more convenient, it's more discreet. 
even though it may have some compromises in image quality compared to a full frame. But when I go to the woods, I actually find that I get higher quality image from the crop sensor camera. And let's not forget that uh, for all those benefits, this camera is like half the cost of a full frame camera. So if you're considering a crop sensor camera or you already have one, getting out into the woods with it might be a great way to, to get some photographic success with that investment. And that's exactly what I was about to do today. But I thought, why not just go ahead and take both cameras out into the woods with me, do some side by side comparisons and then share my results with some interested parties. So without any further ado, let's grab our cameras and get out and have some fun in the woods. So when comparing camera sensors, it's really hard to make apples to apples comparisons because uh, what was a really great sensor on a top end camera last year might be bested by some really cheap camera sensor that just came out yesterday with the latest and greatest technology. I think we've got a pretty good uh, two cameras for comparison here. These are the cameras that I use and um, uh, maybe most relevantly, these are uh, two cameras in the price ranges that a, a prosumer photographer might be shopping within. So my crop sensor camera is the uh, Canon EOS M6 Mark II. It's a 33 megapixel APS-C camera and my full frame camera, I'll show you here in just a second, is the Canon EOS R, which is a 30 megapixel full frame camera with a, an RF mount that can also be adapted to EF lenses. So uh, to further even out the comparison, I'll be able to use the same uh, lenses on both cameras. And because I'll do the testing with a zoom lens, I should be able to leave the cameras in the same position and alter the composition by zooming the lens. Okay, this is a scene that I've shot many times. This is uh, the slanted tree behind me. Every time I come hiking through this way, I, I stop and, and take a shot of it. So this will be the first shot that I'll stop and take. I've never had a chance to shoot it with snow. I think it's an interesting photo subject, but uh, we'll see which camera gives it the best rendition. Okay, I shot this first with the EOS R, the full frame camera at 35 millimeters. And then I switched to the M6 Mark II to shoot it at 20 millimeters. I made the exposures at F9 and ISO 100. I spot autofocused on this tree. I did the raw processing through Adobe Lightroom in the Adobe Color Profile with the sharpening and noise reduction reduced from their default values down to zero. And then I align these images to match in Photoshop. So you'll notice I struggled to match the lighting and framing exactly, but uh, I did draw some conclusions. First was an unexpected result where the EOS R was actually sharper in the center despite its lower sensor resolution. So I poured through all the test shots I made on this day and I drew a pretty firm conclusion that the lens I tested with, uh, which was the EF 16 to 35 millimeter F4 LIS, or at least my copy of it, is sharper at the long end than the wide end. So it's very sharp throughout, but these high resolution sensors can resolve these little differences and quirks. So uh, it's something to keep in mind. However, moving to the foreground, there's a clear advantage to the M6 Mark II in terms of foreground sharpness. And this scene wasn't particularly even all that challenging. There was a, a pretty generous working distance here. And the full frame camera is already struggling at F9. This is another kind of photo where I find that a, a nice crop sensor camera can really give me advantage is when I want to do detailed shots like this in the woods. The woods are full of all kinds of interesting details. If you're not accustomed to taking like details and macro shots when you're out uh, enjoying exploring and hiking in the woods, I highly recommend trying it out. Uh, so this, uh, this down tree here has sort of a split. It's called these splinters and the snow's falling in. I'm going to use the uh, advantage of the crop sensor for a little extra magnification and see if that's uh, better quality maybe than what would be the alternative with a full frame camera of cropping into the image. Yeah, you can see why this is such a good example. I've got this tripod literally as close to this tree as I can get it and it still puts the uh, camera pretty far away from the subject matter. So um, the uh, detail that I was trying to capture is uh, actually pretty small in the frame and if I want to make it into the photograph that I had visualized, yes, I'll have to crop this later. So we'll see if the, um, if the crop sensor camera can do a little better on that. 
Yeah, I messed up the framing of these test photos in about every way possible, but it does show that the depth of field and close-up magnification properties uh, do favor the crop sensor camera. Uh, there shouldn't be any big controversy in that. So it's another win in the woods for the M6 Mark II. So I told myself I wasn't going to get distracted by this today, but it just looks so good and uh, a lot of the snow and ice is supposed to melt this week. So I think I will go pay a little attention to these icicles with both cameras here before I take off. Okay, this last unplanned shooting scenario strays from the intention of today's deep woods photo shoot, and that's what was required to finally show some advantages for the EOS R. So I started with the M6 Mark II and was actually perfectly satisfied with the images I was able to make. But the first difference I noticed when I switched to the EOS R was that the histogram was telling me I could shoot an extra two thirds of a stop brighter before clipping the highlights. So I was able to shoot at one two hundredth of a second instead of one three hundred and twentieth. And that means the sensor was capable of taking in an extra one one hundred and twentieth of a second of light before it clipped the highlights. So to clarify this dynamic range advantage, here are the white clipping masks from Lightroom and you can see that even though the EOS R's raw file is from a longer, brighter exposure, the white clipping mask is about the same. But because of the longer exposure, there is no black clipping to speak of in the EOS R file. Whereas the M6 Mark II wasn't exposed long enough to capture any detail in several of the darkest parts of the image. That's what this black clipping mask is showing us. These parts of the M6 Mark II RAW file are completely black. Uh, this pays dividends in post-processing where you can see that if I wanted to boost the exposure, even several stops to show off textures in these dark areas, the M6 Mark II's file is a lot noisier and flatter and generally less contrasty and less detailed than the EOS R's. So here's a comparison of both RAW files with the noise reduction and sharpening set to zero but you will notice the crop sensor noise is also finer and busier than the full frame. So uh, with the noise reduction applied, there's even extra benefit for the full frame sensor. Uh, then of course I wanted to vary the composition to include more of this tree in the foreground. And that is a trick the crop sensor camera just cannot do. So in conclusion, the EOS R had some major advantages here, but I would stipulate that the field of view and dynamic range limitations of the crop sensor camera are fairly easily overcome by compositing stitched panoramas and exposure brackets, which can be done like basically with a button click in Lightroom, uh, whereas compositing focal point blends to overcome the depth of field limitations imposed by the full frame camera is a much more intensive process and woodland photography presents some of the most challenging cases. So even here, I might prefer the crop camera if I had to choose just one for the job, especially considering most forest photography is not as wide or as contrasty as this example. All right, I really enjoyed that last shot. That one might be a tie. I really expect I got a sharper image off of the uh, crop sensor camera, but I did run up against a uh, compositional limitation and the narrow field of view didn't let me include all the elements that I wanted to include for a wider angle shot. So in that case, maybe I'll prefer the full frame one. But you know, for each uh, job, there's a, an appropriate tool. And I think we found a lot of jobs for which the appropriate tool today was the crop sensor camera. But you guys let me know what you think. Uh, if anything, hopefully I've at least given you some information that you can use to make a wise buying decision, uh, maybe especially inspired you to get your old crop sensor camera out of the closet, get it out of the house and uh, find something that it's really well suited for. So like I mentioned next week, I'd like to have a little discussion about gear that is essential for landscape photography and maybe most importantly, uh, gear that is not essential for landscape photography. So uh, stay tuned next time. Uh, hopefully we'll get you some more information and get you guys who are just getting started out pointed in the right direction. But uh, until then, you keep an eye out and a foot forward and thank you so much for watching.